Good evening. My name is Rick Carter, Director of Alumni and Church Engagement, and we are uh, going to hopefully go live here tonight, but we also are recording this session. I'm with three of our uh, alumni from our Alumni Association who are going to talk tonight about leadership. Dave Dignall is actually going to do our facilitating for us, and so he's going to lead us into this discussion. But we hope that what we say here will be of value to you and helpful for you. Uh, but first, I, I want to tell you a story. Uh, a story about a woman who is uh, real, really making a difference even today. Merle is an individual who, if she entered into any room, you'd hardly notice her, except that you have a love for her because of the difference that she would make in your life. Merle is an individual who is only about four foot five, if that. Uh, she is soft-spoken, quiet. She would uh, never even interrupt you if she needed to talk to you. She would just wait her turn. Uh, but she has influenced countless individuals in her life. Uh, Merle is 110 years old. She's still active in her local church. She's active in her retirement community. She still writes poetry on a daily basis and she can hardly see, she can hardly hear, but she has a joy that makes her attractive. I was at her 110th birthday and at that birthday party, when we finished singing happy birthday to her, she says to everybody in the room, I'll see you next year. It's that kind of optimism that I think makes her attractive, but she's invested her life into people. Uh, when I pastored there outside of Chicago, and Merle was a delight to visit, I would love to go to her house. One winter, I went to her house, and she was out shoveling snow. Now, this is a Merle at 90 years old. Merle's a delightful fact. Let me show you a picture of her. This is Merle. Merle at her 110th birthday party. Uh, you can see that uh, she's a person that would just naturally draw you in, and, uh, and she has a wonderful smile, a wonderful demeanor about her. Well, Merle uh, has lived a long life. Uh, in fact, uh, you could even begin to think about all the things that have been invented since she was born. Uh, electricity and, and all those kinds of things that we take for granted today. She had to go a mile, literally, just to get a pail of water uh, to wash their clothes or to cook with. It's amazing what she has seen in her life. Well, even when it was rare for women to go to college, she ended up with a college degree in Iowa. And uh, she uh, went on to do other amazing things in her life that perhaps we wouldn't consider to be successful. Uh, she was a chemist and she would engineer new chemicals uh, and designs for paint. Paint that would actually stick to uh, a, uh, a uh, armored vehicle in the, in the war times during World War II. So here's an individual that you could just imagine has seen all of life. Well, I tell you her story because she is an event, a, a woman who does incredible things even today. Uh, she's uh, also, uh, done poetry, she's, uh, she's written uh, uh, books. In fact, I wanna tell you a little bit more about that as we kind of continue our discussion. But I wanna turn it over to these guys and let them talk a little bit about influence. And that's what uh, the story of Merle is all about. All about. Uh, she is a person of influence, even though she may not have accomplished all kinds of things that you think are successful today. Uh, so Dave, let me turn it over to you and let you begin our discussion. Thanks, Rick. I am privileged to be joined here today with two really great young men, and I wanted to share a little bit about them, and then they're gonna share a little bit of their story with you. I am joined today, first of all, by Jason, with Jason Denniston here, who's an independent insurance consultant and is the uh, owner of the Denniston Insurance Agency. Jason, we welcome you, glad to have you here. Good to be here. And Nathan Smith, who is serving as the Contact Center Manager for Lincoln Financial. Nathan, thanks for joining us Thank today. you so much. If you're watching this live, if we, have, as Rick said earlier, if we manage to be able to capture this live, uh, if you'd like to post a question to us at any point during our conversation, you can do that on the Facebook page and we'll try our best to get back to you. If we don't answer your question during our time together, we'll answer that question later. If you do ask us a question and you'd like to be, if you do that, you can register to win a free gift. Rick will talk a little bit more about that with you uh, a little bit later on in, their, in our program. Guys, let's get started in talking about this whole idea of leadership. Rick's kind of set us up to talk about leadership from really the definition 
uh, that is we call influence. Uh, I think it was years ago John Maxwell you know came up with the idea that uh, at least he's famous for coining the phrase you know leadership is influence it's one word and if we think about influence I guess the question I would start out for you is how do you find yourself being a leader today how are you being a person of influence where are you investing your influence uh, at this point in time Jason can you start us off please yeah I'd love to uh, when I think about leadership and this idea of influence I really think that we can can influence people uh, in every area of our life no matter where we're at I mean everywhere from how you treat your server at a restaurant uh, mm -hmm. maybe to, to how you treat the cashier um, at a checkout and especially when we're doing business or in the workplace how we treat individuals when things maybe don't go exactly as you had planned maybe how you thought they were um, how you react to a situation really influences um, not only the situation but it influences other people and their reactions and so if you think about it sort of like being a thermostat in the room so you, you know thermometers only reflect the temperature of the room but thermostats actually affect the actual temperature and so the way that you respond the way that you react uh, can have an effect on on everyone that you interact with um, I've heard that that even the most introverted of individuals will impact literally hundreds of people on a daily basis and so really being mindful of of our words and our actions how we choose to respond uh, to our environments whether it's home work or, or casual relationships I think you can be a leader in all of those aspects that's great uh, I'd like that idea of being a thermostat rather than a thermometer I'd like that that's a mm -hmm. great way to look at mm -hmm. it Nathan talk to us about your leadership journey how do you see yourself leading um, and being a person of influence sure. I think piggybacking off of what Jason was saying uh, I was hearing investing so as you're influencing people around you, it's about all those little investments that you do uh, when you're paying attention to those people around you, when you're trying to find out what's important to them, what motivates them, and that's how you can succeed in this, this ladder that Maxwell talks about, the five levels of leadership, mm -hmm. where you're trying to get to a point where uh, people are inspired to follow you. That takes a lot of legwork, and maybe when you're first set in charge of a team, you don't have that kind of buy-in. And then that's where the role as a leader, you step in and you start investing in those people and you connect with them. How are you doing? What motivates you? What are your struggles? How can I assist you? Uh, where would you like to see this head together? And then as you start to get that buy-in, then you can cast your vision and then you can journey as a group together. So I've had uh, the privilege of uh, being over a lot of different teams. I have a lot of people coming and going from my team and every new iteration, every few months, it's great. This is a new chance to cast that vision of what we want to accomplish as a team, where we're heading together and really capitalizing on everybody's strengths. But it takes a lot of investment. It takes really getting to know who they are so that you can find the best dynamic with that group of people. Because every group of people that you lead will be a little different. So it, it's worthwhile to take that moment to find out where everybody's at. You know, if I could, you know, you know, kind of well, something that I picked up on what you're saying, that idea of uh, investing is really about being intentional. Yes. And um, kind of contrasting what I said, well, you know, everyone influences somebody. I think real leaders are intentional about how they're making uh, that, that impact and influence. And I right. really, really like that idea of investing. That's mm -hmm. good. I'm glad you guys have talked about that because I was thinking in preparation for our time together about one of the biggest early mistakes I made as a, as a young leader. And I didn't even see myself as a, as a leader at that time. Mm -hmm. Because when I was going to school uh, in my undergraduate work, no one ever talked about leadership. No one ever talked about in the investment that you guys are talking about. And I went to, I remember my first solo pastorate. And uh, I ended up going to a church and I'd never been there ever in my life. Um, I was, uh, the organization that I was with at that time appointed 
ministers to places. And so I show up, my wife and I show up in our moving truck and we unload for the, I mean, we see the church and the house for the very first time. Uh, I mean, we had pictures, but I mean, that was it. And we unload and then the treasurer and his wife came by and invited us to their home for dinner. And we obviously uh, accepted that invitation. We went over to their home and while we were there, they were asking me about my vision for the church. Well, here I am, the, the young pastor, and, I'm, and so I'm casting my vision and sharing all my dreams and aspirations and how God was going to help us to grow a great church. Mm -hmm. I was really excited about it. And I'll never forget when I finally stopped talking. Um, <laughs> uh, Mary, Bud's wife, just sat there, and all of a sudden she just went, hmm. Now you can understand, these people are in their 70s. Mm -hmm. And she says, hmm. Well, when you've been here for a little while, you'll see how we do things here. And mm -hmm. I didn't understand because I thought because the name pastor, you know, was, was part of my name, that, that, that my, my name was on the door. I had the title. I had the position. Mm -hmm. I thought that automatically everybody would follow me. I didn't understand until years later, and you referenced uh, Maxwell's five levels of leadership. I didn't realize that here I was trying to lead and trying to exercise influence when I had no influence yet. I didn't know that I had to build those relationships over a period of time sure. and grow that. And you know who the leaders of that church were? Bud and Mary. Right. <laughs> and if Bud and Mary didn't say yes to anything that I said, it wouldn't fly. And, but no one ever taught me that. And it was years later that finally the wake up call hit. And I realized that I had to make those investments in people over time. And so that was, that's kind of one of my, uh, that's one of my failures in leadership mm -hmm. in the earliest days. Mm -hmm. When did you recognize the value of leadership in your own life? Yeah, sure, I can start. I know with one of the roles I had a few years ago, uh, I started seeing opportunities around the workplace, things that I felt very passionate about, things mm -hmm. that I wanted to see change. And so <clears throat> I stepped out and I started like setting up meetings and bringing together groups of um, influencers and decision makers. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, I have influence now and I have the authority to go ahead and start priming some change around here. Now, some of those work groups went better than others. And I think what I've seen over the years is <clears throat> building those relationships ahead of time those relationships that don't have a measurable goal or outcome, where you're just connecting with people and understanding them. The more uh, background work that I did, w the better. And so when a work group would come together and I'd have a few of those key people, you could just see it on their faces. You'd have the eye contact, they'd be writing notes, they'd speak up because they were excited to follow you. You were on their side. You had joint goals in common. So. Mm -hmm. Anytime you lead a group, you can cast that vision, but it helps to have the buy-in ahead of time. So what I learned in the last 10 years was be doing those extra things so that by the time you do have something that you're really passionate about, you invite people to come alongside of you, and then you get to journey together and come to that joint outcome. That's been the exciting part. That's great, that's great. Jason. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, that's really great. I think my ideas are a lot along those same lines um, and, and understanding when did I first, first recognize the value of leadership. And I think it really boils down um, to this, when I found, and you know, when I was working in the church, found that we were struggling with, with volunteers. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that idea that that we were struggling getting the volunteers to to work in the ministries, and and starting to think about like, well, why is it that people are not wanting to volunteer? What it is? What is it that that about it that they're you know we're not creating an inviting in you know atmosphere of wanting people to come get involved? And that's when I realized it boils down to to leadership, or as Nathan said, like being intentional about investing you know and mm -hmm. adding value into people's lives and as we we think about those five levels of leadership that Matt, uh, that uh, Maxwell you know has written about 
and, and really evaluating, okay, at what level do I need to invest? Maybe, um, maybe for certain individuals, they just need that relational connection. You know, it's about connecting with them relationally. Once, you know, they're, we're friends, you know, then we can say, hey, why don't you come join me, mm -hmm. you know, on this, you know, this adventure in serving. But maybe for, for others, you know, individuals, it's more about, you know, investing in them more in a leadership way, you know, more like, hey, developing their skills, helping them see why it's important for them to be involved. And so really evaluating, okay, what does this person need? Instead of saying, mm -hmm. what do I need? I need more volunteers, <laughs> you know, right. I need volunteers. And so you will do. But when you go to these people and say, okay, what can I invest? Or like you were saying, you know, how can I invest in them? What value can I add to them? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as you know, we, we never want to do this just you know, because of what we get out of it. We want to invest in people because we value people. But at the natural outcome of those leadership type investments are now people who are, are wanting to, to be involved. So I think whether you're in a not-for-profit volunteer situation and you find yourself struggling to get volunteers or you're in a corporate setting mm -hmm. and you're struggling with low morale, or, or, you know, infighting and difficulty. Engagement. Yeah, engagement, you know, vision buy-in, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that is. Start thinking about, you know, them instead of you. How can you invest in them? And I think you will find that you reap the rewards. You know, if leadership is influence, then influence is all about relationships. Yeah. And that's what you guys are saying. And I think it's so true. And, and investing in people does have to be, I love the word intentional. Uh, my friend Dan Ryland told me many, many years ago when we were both in Southern California that he had started a practice of, he would pick 12 men every year and he would spend one year with them. They'd meet monthly, they would read leadership books together, they would, uh, they would go on a spiritual journey for a year together. And then when those 12 would graduate, then he would take on 12 more and what happened was that over the next several years, Dan ended up with a crew at the time he and I were talking about it, he'd been piloting this for a while. He says, I have 60 guys in my orb, you know, mm -hmm. in my circle of influence that I can call on them mm -hmm. at any time to do anything. He said, if I, I've got a Sunday school class, he said, if I get up that morning and I'm sick, I can call any one of those guys. And even if they don't have the gift of teaching, you know what they'll mm -hmm. do? They'll dive and say, Dan, I got your back. Mm. and they'd do anything for him. And, but those became the men who would eventually take the leadership roles uh, in various, various areas of the church, not just under Dan's ministry, but under other areas. But it was all about that, in, that intentional mm -hmm. investment, pouring, you know, he was pouring himself into their lives, and I'm hearing you guys talk about the same thing. You're pouring yourself into someone else, not for what you can get out of it, but rather what you can give to them so that they can actually maximize their potential. That's, a, that's an outstanding observation. We keep talking about the five levels of leadership and some of our observers mm -hmm. may not even know what we're talking about. But when we talk about the five levels of leadership, uh, the lowest level, level one would be positional leadership and that's where people follow us because they have to. We have the title, we're the boss, and, and unfortunately so many people kind of get stuck there. The second level is about permission. People will follow us because, well, they want to. They may like us. They trust us a little bit. We've got a little bit of rapport with them. The third level would be results. And results more so in what we have done for the organization. They see that we care about the organization, that the organization is important, and they see us investing in it. Well, then, okay, they'll follow. And that's a little higher level. Mm -hmm. The fourth level, though, is in reproduction. And it's because of what we've done for them. And when, you know, when we've invested, and that's what you're talking about, when we've invested in them, um, then they're more likely to follow. And that's a really, really great level to be at. And then the fifth level, some people say that we never achieve it in this lifetime, <laughs> and others would argue that we do, but it's what we call pinnacle. And that's people follow you because of who you are. Your, your reputation is sound. Uh, you have integrity. And they'll follow you because you've proven yourself over time. Um, 
And then these are not things that we can just march through and think, well, in the next three months, I'm gonna get to level mm -hmm. five with all the people that are in my leadership circle. But it's something that we keep in mind, that we grow with those people. I think that's important. You guys, I, I thought it would be best to summarize it for our viewers in case that they're not familiar with five levels of leadership. Sometimes a question get at, gets asked, by people, especially if they say, oh, I can't be a leader, or I'm a terrible leader, or I don't know how to become a good leader. If you'll let me use the phrase leadership quotient, what do you do or what have you done? What are some things that you have found helpful in, to increase your leadership quotient? What's made you a better leader? You know, um, to me, I love that quote by uh, Charlie Tremendous Jones, um, you're going to be the same person uh, in five years that you are today, except for the books that you read and the people that you meet. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we talk about being intentional about investing in others as leaders, but we can also lead ourselves <laughs> to being a better leader by investing in ourselves. So, I mean, the two things that, that I really try and do to become a better leader, a better individual, is one, you know, what am I reading? Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be books, you right. know, it can be media that we're consuming online and blogs and videos. Um, but also, I, I find it very important uh, to network. You know, networking with other professionals in, in my, you know, professional career who are helping me become better professionally but also networking interpersonally with people that I see are, are good leaders, are, have qualities that, that I would like to have. And you know, it may be like when I'm on the road, you know, just calling them up and, and having conversations, yeah. asking questions, making the most out of you know, small nuggets of time and incrementally over time, just trying to become a better leader, a better person, the, better, the, the best person that God has called me to be. Mm -hmm. That's great. How about you, Nathan? What do you do? Sure. Uh, at my workplace, we talk heavily about how much you do within your current role, that mm -hmm. a lot of your growth can come just from your day-to-day -day activities. And so uh, when I've seen, look back over my life and seen growth and leadership, it really comes about because I'm, an opportunity comes up and I say yes, and I lean in and I take advantage of that. And I've had the opportunity to lead uh, different sports groups, which I am not talented <laughs> physically, but I've coached uh, little kids' teams, I've uh, led worship teams, I've directed theater, I've led uh, different workshops and uh, managed different groups of people. And each time I do something different, I'm around a different group of people. And it's a fresh opportunity to figure out what makes that group click, what they need, what's going to inspire them, and you just learn that much more about human nature and, and about what people in your area are like. Because maybe people in Indiana are kind of like this, and then people in Nebraska are a little bit like this, and then if you travel across the world, I've had the privilege of traveling to some different areas of the world, they have different ways that they're motivated. So every opportunity is a chance to understand people better, and the more that you're exposed to different types of people, ages, ethnic, ethnicities, and religions, and that sort of thing, it just builds your, your memory bank of, okay, you get a new scenario and you're like, I can do this. Yeah. Like, I have some background to go off of. So I would encourage the audience that when an opportunity comes up, you say, I don't know how to do this, but let's step in, let's find out what it's like. Make some mistakes, maybe your dynam dynamic didn't go well, but you learn from that, and then you try again. And then um, a follow-up would be relationships, networking like you said, getting in and finding some people that can invest in you, speak truth into your lives, people that you can mirror and copy that have been there before and done it all that you can learn from. Um, maybe it's uh, you take a specific job because there's that boss there that you really want to work under and you know that they're going to inspire you. So surrounding yourself with people that can inspire you. You guys are so much younger than I am. I'm, I'm the old dude here at the, at the, at the uh, uh, here on the stand. But um, when I was younger, I loved being able to connect with those older pastors and older leaders, and who had you know blazed the trail, even before leadership became a buzzword. 
uh, but they were leaders. And, and I loved being able to just call them up and say, hey, can I spend an hour with you? Can you just, I just want to ask you some questions. And they were so generous with their time. And I've always tried to keep that in mind. If someone, the phone rings for me, to be able to sit down with someone mm -hmm. and say, you got it. You know, not that I think I have a lot to offer, but hey, they did it for me, I'm gonna pass it on. But you know what I find myself doing now? Mm -hmm. I find myself calling the younger guys <laughs> and, and say, talk to me about leadership. Talk to me about how you are gaining influence. Because uh, I don't think, first of all, we're ever too old to learn. And I'm discovering that again, some, some of my older resources are no longer with us, but I'm finding such an energy that comes uh, for me, I'm you know, 59 years old, um, and I still feel like, man, I've, I've still got 25 more years of ministry left in me, and a lot of it's because I'm inspired by some of the younger leaders that are around me, and they help keep my vision fresh, challenge me, push me. Right. Um, they look at me, and, and even and they're bold enough sometimes to say, why do you do that? <laughs> and I look and go, that's a good question <laughs> and have to come up with a response and sometimes I have to look back and say thank you very much for challenging me um, and then I love to read biographies uh, I don't you know I just I'd love to read and they don't have to necessarily some of them are not necessarily Christian leaders uh, I love to read biographies of world leaders presidents all kinds of different people uh, coaches whatever and I but I learned from that's the reading side for mm -hmm. me is the on the biography side people are, who are doing it in the trenches. I really enjoy that. So that's one thing, those are a couple of things that I like to do, especially tapping into to you guys. Uh, <laughs> I've learned a couple of things from you tonight in, as, as we've been talking together. If you were to be able to give anybody a, a word of counsel to say, you know what, if you, if you could just do one thing to get yourself started toward that edge in leadership, to sharpen you know, sharpen the point of the stick, as it were, whatever terms we want to use, but get that edge. What would you encourage them to do to uh, start moving forward as a person of influence? Nathan? Sure. Um, one theme that I've been hearing recently is uh, find one thing and find that one thing, that one extra thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And I recently heard an Indiana Wesleyan Summit that it's the sum of all those little things that you're doing over time yeah. that makes you into something greater than yourself. So some people are waiting for some big miraculous thing. I need that big job change. I need to land that big position. I need a big project. But it's really all those small things that you're doing that add up over time. So you wake up in the morning and you say, what's one extra thing I can do? Is there a proposal I can write? Is there a, a relationship I can invest in? Maybe I look into getting my master's, but it's not just like, oh, I need to do everything around getting my master's. It's like, let me inquire at that one college. Let me make one connection mm -hmm. and see where that takes me. And we're all very busy people. Technology has just made us busier, really. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, finding those opportunities to make a connection with a person and do a small investment that day, you'll be surprised at the end of just one week. If you're doing one small investment every day, that's seven investments times four weeks times 12 months. You'll be amazed what you come up with. So maybe you don't have a big, you know, maybe you didn't read a book and you're like, this changed my life. <laughs> that's okay. Right. You already have a whole plate of things that you can be doing right now that can help move you forward. Just find that inspiration, find out what applies to your life right now, find one thing to start with today. That's a great piece of advice. Jason, what would you Yeah, say? I mean, I think, you know, my thoughts, you know, flow along a lot of the same lines, maybe it's a little bit, you know, shift. Um, I would say, you know, try and, and add value uh, or invest in, in like everyone you come across. You know, just like yeah, every like day, that. just yeah. try, like, because what it, the first thing that that does is it gets you outside of yourself and thinking about that other person, you know, and saying, okay, what can I do to add value to them? What can I do to invest in them? How can I, you know, and it may, you know, if you're just walking down the street, 
and maybe as simple as smiling at someone, <laughs> making eye contact, yeah, sure. you know, to, to have an influence on them, um, to, you know, your coworkers, and, and, you know, it's just that idea of like, what can I do to invest in them? Because, you know, if you, if you just focus in on other people and doing those small investments, over time, you will become a leader. You will, you will become a person of influence because you know, you've built those relationships. You, know, you have uh, invested in those people. All of a sudden you'll find that without even trying, you know, you're like moving up you know, the levels of leadership just because you were focused in on other people and trying to add value to them. That's, that's so rich and so important. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm going to come at it from a, uh, just kind of giving a biblical illustration of everything you guys are talking about, and it, all, it really is wrapped up in the life of Jesus. When you think about Jesus, uh, obviously we could talk about him in a lot of different aspects, but he was the consummate leader. But he was also the, he was the consummate grace giver and all of those things. But what, if, what it was about him is he added value to people, especially the people that were in the most desperate need for it. The people who didn't think they needed value, added value, well, you know, well, that was their problem. Yeah. But think of the people he touched, the broken, uh, the people who were marginalized by their culture, their society. They were undervalued as people. Um, and uh, as I read through, especially the Gospel of Luke, and I see that Jesus gave value to children. Mm. And in his day, children were to be, well, not just seen and not heard, but, well, it was better that they weren't seen. You know, women were very much undervalued in that culture, and yet Jesus valued the women of the day. The people who were sick, who had illnesses, um, uh, you know, disabilities, they were cast aside by their culture, and yet he found the ability to invest and give value. Right. And what a great example for us. Um, and, and again, if we think of our uh, purpose at Indiana Wesleyan University and the idea to be a world changer, um, you know, we change our world one person at a time. Oh, that's good. And that person that you and I invest in, well, we're changing the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great way to go. Mm -hmm. I think at this time we'll ask Rick, if he's able to, to come and maybe give us a couple parting words. Uh, I know that he has some words to talk about Merle. Well, this has been uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to gather and to, uh, to join in here. And I'm just going to pull into the uh, view with all of you. We talked a bit about Merle. Uh, 110, technically 110 and a half. <laughs> she would remind us of that. One thing that uh, I didn't tell you in the first part uh, was she was not only a person of, of grace and uh, humility, but she was a person who had a tenacity about her. Mm. When she would put her mind to something, she would follow through with that. Uh, one example of this tenacity or this um, uh, streak of, of fierceness, I guess we'll say, was when I went to visit her, there was uh, a knock on the door and apparently one of her tenants that uh, she had different ones that she would rent rooms and one of her tenants came over and was not very happy uh, with uh, his arrangement. And uh, he was not paying his rent, so, he, so Merle kept the deposit and he came back to collect the deposit. <laughs> and uh, so she said, oh, excuse me, pastor, in her very timid way, went outside on the porch and all of a sudden I began to hear the voices were getting louder and louder and so I thought, oh my goodness, Merle's in trouble. So I went back outside just in time to watch her grab this six foot guy, twice her weight, if not three times her weight, and little Merle, four foot five, throwing this man off the porch. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm glad I got out here. And I was afraid the guy might charge back at her, so I thought I'll get in between, but instead I said to the gentleman, I said, it's a good thing I came out here, because Merle could have hurt you. <laughs> well, Merle, when we celebrated her 110th, everybody at the party talked about her influence, uh, talked about how she made a difference in their life. She was listening 
to the stories they would talk about. She was an individual that always showed up for the kids' programs. She never missed a vacation Bible school. She didn't sit on the sidelines. She got involved, even in the, the wet and wild of our vacation Bible school, she was there mm -hmm. and she wanted to participate. Um, but what you don't know about Merle, I told you she was an author and a poet, but what's remarkable about her is that she has authored books. She used to walk from street to street selling her books, house to house. You could imagine that there, everybody bought a book because right. Merle was at her door. Yeah. But not only did she author one book, but she authored many books. She authored now a total of 13 books. Do you know when she started authoring her books? Her first book was published when she was 70 years old. Wow. That's a time when most people say, I've lived a good life and good. I'm done. done. Mm -hmm. And Merle said, no, I'm just beginning. Wow. So she saw her life as leading, maybe she just saw her life as making a difference, being a person of influence. She wasn't looking to get status and she didn't have any status, but she was looking to make a difference. And so as you were talking, obviously Merle is one of those examples that we want to talk about. We were able to get the feed out there uh, live. We did have Good. some people get on, Good. so Good. we had a few hiccups Good. early on. Thank but we're, you. We're excited that we were able to to have viewers, and there was a few shout outs, by the way, Jason. You got a shout out. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. You know. Hi, Jason. Yeah. Uh, so, right. uh, so we were able to do that. We wanted you to ask some questions, and uh, so we, we want to give you a website just or an email. Just send us those questions, or you could post on the feed, and we'll begin to answer some of those questions that might come in. And as you see this, uh, maybe on a YouTube later, certainly, we want to encourage you to participate. And if you do, uh, these little gifts here on my uh, camera can uh, be sent to you in a contest sort of way. Uh, so when you send in the questions, uh, we'll enter you in a contest and we'll pick some random winners over the next couple of weeks. Uh, that way you can get some uh, some good stuff from IW, especially the bobblehead. I mean, who doesn't <laughs> want a bobblehead? <laughs> uh, look at that guy, just, just waiting to go to somebody's home. So, uh, But these are great opportunities for us uh, to have gathered tonight to talk about leadership. We want to do more events like this um, as we uh, participate in the future. Hopefully you guys can join us. One of the topics that we really were thinking about uh, talking about, and it may have to wait till after Christmas, of course, we're into the holiday season, but we do want to talk about branding, your personal brand, your, your professional brand, and as introduction, let's tease that out a little bit for these folks. <laughs> so let's talk about branding. Dave, what's a good question that might lead us into this topic on branding? You get some people would ask the question, what in the world does it mean to even have a brand? That might be something that someone might want to even know. Other discussion, how about you guys? What do you think? Let's tease it out a little for the, give some people ideas about it. Sure, so I see brand as being the persona that you give off to the people around you. So mm -hmm. we're talking about influence and investing, but what is the niche that you've really developed yes. for yourself? And that can look different in different settings, whether it's your church or your workplace or your family, you may have a different persona in those. It doesn't mean that you are being a fake person, but you might find a different application for different parts of your skill set, your expertise, right. your backgrounds. And so your brand ends up being that person, like the fifth level of leadership that you're talking about, where yeah. people say, hey, I have a, a pretty good idea of who Jason is. Jason's this kind of guy. And everybody has kind of a brand, uh, whether they know it or not. You know, I think, uh, you know, on the, I was thinking about that idea of a personal brand, and uh, we think about this so much online, because, you know, everybody, it's like, it's so easy to, to put promotion out, and, and so many people are masters of this idea of brand, and they don't even think about it. It's like, they take 17 selfies, you know, to get that right angle, you know, because they're putting out a brand. Sure. They want to be seen in a particular way. Um, and I think going back to this idea uh, of leadership, you know, we influence people through our personal brand. We influence people's um, opinion about us through the way we represent ourselves or represent our brand. And, and on top of that, you know, we need to be intentional. You know, I think so many times um, a, a lot of younger people in particular don't think about this idea. They, they value uh, transparency so much 
that they just put everything out there online, mm -hmm. and that can hurt your personal brand, you know, in the future when it comes to employment and and business and in the corporate setting. So it's important to yeah. manage. There's your brand. a lot we have that we can talk about, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when we think of not only personal brand, but you know, a lot of times people get hooked up on the whole, whole idea of the corporate brand. And we can spend so much money in this area of marketing and, and all of that stuff. Uh, and yet it's really, it comes right down to um, not so much even the marketing, not so much the logo and all that stuff, but are you who you say you are? Exactly. And, uh, integrity. and yep. the integrity and all of it. And I think those will be, that'll be a really good thing for us to flesh out when we get together again and uh, bring some other people to the table and talk to us about branding. Hmm. Looking forward to it, right? Yeah. Well, it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, I knew you guys could tease this out. <laughs> so I think this has been wonderful. Um, Jonelle Sherman has often joined us in this yep. way. She is an enrollment specialist with the university. Her and I are going to do a talk session here in a couple of weeks, and we're going to record that and put that out. And so she has some ideas for that, kind of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion. So she'll have that to uh, share with us. But what we're really wanting to do, engage you online uh, and also engage you in person. We want you to come to events that we will be uh, putting out there after the new year, of course. Uh, but we want you to have a wonderful, uh, um, wonderful Christmas and Thanksgiving, of course, just around the corner as we're recording this. Uh, but we hope that the information that's shared will entice you to say, how do I get involved in that group? Find us on Facebook at IWU Alumni, of course. Uh, you can also look and find our group for Fort Wayne. Uh, this is part of that team uh, that are helping us to put things together like this. And we want you to, of course, meet the whole team and come and join us uh, and be a part of these things in the future. So thanks so very much for your willingness to join us here tonight. Any parting words of wisdom, Dave, that you have? I, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> well, that pretty much settles it. Though. And look, and, and Jason, just so you know, you got another shout out here. Oh, so, man. Man. You're the popular tonight. guy tonight. Mitch, you might trending. get to take the bobblehead home with us. <laughs> hey, I'll so. take it. <laughs> well, great. Well, we'll wrap it up. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, folks. Yep.